is full of stories. Stories of mysteries, of curiosities, of oddities. Join Cat and Jethro Gilligan Toth for the strange, the bizarre, the unexpected, as they lift the lid and cautiously peer inside the box of oddities. Good day, freaks! Hello, freaks! It's so great to have you here, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages. Welcome to the Freak Show! <laughs> um, this is actually, uh, it, it's almost cathartic for us because we really miss doing live shows. We do. Um, and we did so many so quickly. Like we were still new to the whole podcasting thing and we got a call and it was like, do you want to do this live show? And we were like, yes, we do. And then we did another one. And then we did another one, and we did another one, and we didn't have time to stop and think how over our heads we were. Yeah, and now we've had an entire year to think about it. <sighs> oh, God. <laughs> But I'm super excited. We are legit planning live shows, and this looped opportunity for us, I think, is going to be a blast. It's going to be so much fun, and we are so grateful that you joined us here tonight for the very first loop show, The Freak Show. And um, my thought is that probably you're going to walk away from this greatly disturbed. And if, and if so, we've done our job. Yay! Yay! <laughs> um, if you are not a regular listener to the Box of Oddities podcast, you are welcome here. Um, this is a, a thing that we do at the beginning of all of our live shows um, because it's sometimes that does happen. Sometimes someone says, hey, do you want to come see a show with us? Or, hey, do you want to watch this thing with me? And so you may not n already know what all this is about. Yeah. Uh, be patient. Uh, apologies in advance because... <laughs> You really don't have any fucking idea what's going to happen next. Uh, <laughs> it, it could get ugly. It often does. Mm. But um, we're glad you're here, and uh, perhaps you'll become part of the uh, Freak family. And for those of you who do listen to the podcast, we're so glad that the family's with us. And so far, no one's, like, died or fallen asleep at shows, so... No. We're doing good. We've had some interesting things happen. Um, and, wow, you remember we were in uh, Nashville... And uh, a lady had flown from Costa Rica. Yeah. That was a lot of pressure. There was, that was the same show where people got engaged, right? On stage. Unreal. Yeah. So you never know what's going to happen. And since this is the freak show, I think it's fair to say that this is no exception. None. It's going to be freaky. And the first order of business, really, I think, is open a cold one. Settle in. All right. Get ready for some freakiness. Here we go. Uh, yeah. Did you? I'm wearing you, heels and it was a mistake. There are cobwebs on these feathers. Did you specifically? Is that? I imported those. That's, is that with the feathers or the cobwebs? The cobwebs. Okay, because it, it looks like an, eh. an incredible effort on set design. Thank you. Well done. I took my cues from Tower of Terror. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so here's how it works for those of you who are new. Um, I'll do a story. We have what we call the thing in the middle, which is kind of a surprise piece, and then Kat does a story. And sometimes it can get kind of dark. And since this is our first looped show, we thought we'd go way over the top <laughs> <laughs> with the freaky darkness. All well, right. uh, well, mine's not dark. Yours isn't? No. Okay, well, good, because mine is. Okay. Mine is, so. Mine's disturbing. Also, hold on. Where is it coming from? What, are you, what is it? I have a hair that keeps, it's all in my face. Yeah. There you go. Do you ever get like a hair caught right where your glasses pinch yes. and then, you know, it drops? Yeah, and then it's like, yeah, mm. yeah. yeah. Going to talk about. <laughs> oh, yes. Thank you for oh, joining yeah, us. Yeah. Hello. Sorry, I almost forgot you were there. Um, you never really know what you're going to find in a storage locker that you buy at auction. 
That's true. That's why there's a whole show about it. Yeah. What is it? Storage wars where people, I don't know. They, you've seen this, right? You, you, you go to a storage locker. You don't know what's inside. You bid on it. And then whatever's in it is yours, good and or bad. You're hoping that you're prob- probably going to get like a, um, a case of uh, gold bars or something. Yes. That, that's what we all hope for. All the time. I'm putting my gold bars mm-hmm. in a storage locker. It happens. Yeah. Um, it, well, that's really the most appealing thing about it. You just really don't know. Yeah, it's like a surprise egg. Sometimes what you find in an uh, abandoned storage locker will haunt your dreams for the rest of your life. <laughs> okay. Check this out. And what's the problem there? I got a human foot. Have a what? A human left foot. What's your name? My name's Shannon Winston. This plum nasty got me grossed out. Plum grossed him out. Yeah. Is yeah, thing. I guess so. <laughs> All right. So I have some explaining to do. Here's what happened. In 2005, there was a storage shed auction. A guy named Shannon Winsnet, who calls himself an entrepreneur uh, with a lifelong dream of being rich and famous. He craved the spotlight. And he thought that the way to go about this was buying storage lockers? Well, he was an entrepreneur as well as, you know, wanting to become a showman. It was okay. kind of a dual dream. But this opportunity fell into his lap and uh, he saw it as a chance to become rich and famous mm-hmm. and maybe even a, uh, a television personality. From a storage locker? Yeah. In the very front of the storage locker was... A barbecue smoker. Oh. So he pulls the smoker out. He takes it home. He goes to to clean it up. And he flips open the lid. And inside it is a severed human leg. Was it smoked? In in, in the barbecue grill. Well, it looked that way. It kind of took him back. uh, Set him back on his his heels a little bit. Sure. It looked like, uh, like the leg was mummified. Oh. It was kind of all gnarly and stuff. Was there like a dry rub? E, well, or was it saucy? Because that depends. I mean, it totally depends on what kind of barbecue you're in for. Sure. Well, I would say probably saucy because when he was describing it to the news crew, okay. he said he could feel the cholesterol leaking out of the leg. Oh, well, that's I the problem with barbecue. I, it's, it's high in cholesterol. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I only know about dry rub and sauce because of Guy Fieri. So he. Uh, he calls 911. Oh, Guy Fieri. He, uh, he calls 911. The local news stations catch wind of this. Okay. And they show up in droves. And, of course, this, <laughs> this becomes kind of a catalyst for him because now he's on TV. Sure. And this is what he's wanted all along. Rolaids couldn't help. Tom's couldn't help. Pepto couldn't help. My stomach was in bad shape yesterday. After I found this, mm-hmm. I said, oh, my God, there's a human foot. My mother and her boyfriend said, uh-uh. I said, look for yourself. Five toes, five toenails. Put it in an airtight box with a glass window on it. Bob Cook wrote off Business 321, $1 admission. Oh, hey. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I think that would be one of those uh, really difficult to get through news stories without being like, so anyway, <laughs> I don't know. So Shannon's pretty jazzed about this because he wants to be famous. Right. And so he starts calling himself the footman. Oh, God. And, it's, well, it's very creative, and I have to say. He's, uh, he's thinking, uh, you know, because he's entrepreneurial minded, that this is his chance to become a modern day P.T. Barnum if P.T. Barnum had a a garage sale. So he's going to, like, put the foot on display? Yeah, that's what he did Um, in his his garage. And he, uh, it was like a roadside attraction. He charged $3 for adults, but kids were only a buck. Oh, that's nice. That was nice I mean, he's obviously charitable. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, so just so I understand, he has the... The foot set up in the garage so that people can come in and view it. But but he charges them for, like, is it in a case or how no, does he have right it? No, it's right the barbecue smoker. Oh, he kept he just, it in the smoker. Yeah, I mean. It's part the, of the appeal. It's sure. The, well, it's it, the uh, 
What's the word that they use on Antiques Roadshow? Uh, prov- providence. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, Thank exactly. You. Exactly. It, it was... Uh, <laughs> the barbecue smoker is the providence for uh-huh. the foot. It is. Okay. Uh, well, he actually, <laughs> at one point, tried to just, just um, uh, do a roadside attraction with the empty smoker. He actually thought people would want to come and see this empty old barbecue this, that this. had a foot in it, even though there was no foot in it. He wasn't... He didn't have. He wasn't going to, you know, display the foot. At oh the time. wow! Just the, but nobody. There were no takers. So shocking. He put the barbecue. Uh, we told you you'd be shocked. So shocked and amazed. There you go. That itself is shocking. So <laughs> he he puts the the severed leg back in the barbecue grill, and it's like a really demented lemonade stand. He just has it hauled out by the side of his of the road near his house with a sign, and it's written in Sharpie, and it's up on no. a telephone pole, and it says, see the severed leg, or no, it was the barbecue leg. See the, see the barbecue leg. Okay. $3 adults, $1 for children. <laughs> so I know probably... <laughs> See the barbecue leg. Yeah. Okay. Probably right now, right about now, you're thinking, what the fuck? Because that's what I was thinking. Sure. Um, how did a severed human leg end up in a, in a barbecue smoker in a storage shed? You know, I hadn't even gotten to that. Oh, the spirits. I hadn't even gotten to that point because I was still focused on the guy wanting to have a lemonade stand of foot. Yep. A foot lemonade stand. Here's the backstory. There was a prominent businessman in this town. His name was Tom Wood. He was a very successful furniture manufacturer, quite well off. Um, In fact, the plant that he owned employed just about everybody in the town. Oh, wow. Okay. And the Woods were very well-to-do. The family was was quite well off. Tom's son, John, grew up, pretty nice home, Mm -hmm. pretty well-to-do. His fa- uh, father bought him go karts and oh, dirt nice. bikes and stuff like that. So he had pretty much everything he wanted. I'm a big fan of the Woods. Elle Woods. She uh, made a real impact on me. Um, she reminded me that we can always make a difference as long as we believe in ourselves. And uh, because of that, Cat is now considering a, a legal career. Um, <laughs> his father, Tom, was also an amateur pilot. Oh, okay. And he had, they owned a small private aircraft. Very cool. Tom decided one day he was going to take his family for a, a ride in the airplane. Okay. So at, at this point now, a little bit more information. John had uh, been addicted to drugs and alcohol for a while. Okay. And so it had strained the relationship with mm-hmm. him and his, and his parents. But he, at this point, had been clean for about a year. He was trying to repair his relationship, okay. specifically with his father. Admirable. So, so they go for a plane ride. It's uh, Tom, John, uh, John's sister and brother-in-law. Okay. And they take off in the airplane and they fly over this little mountain range. And as soon as they get over the range, they hit some air pockets and updrafts or downdrafts or some kind of draft that's not good. Wonky air. Yeah. And uh, the engine stalled Ooh. and they plummeted oh. nose first into the ground. Now, Tom was piloting the plane. John was co-piloting okay. the plane. Tom was killed. Uh, John lost his leg in the, uh, in the crash. Oh. The other passengers were injured, but not seriously. Okay. Um, John blamed himself because he was, you know, he was co-piloting. Mm-hmm. He kept telling himself that there must, be some, must have been something I could have done sure. to, to save the situation, to save my dad. And again, he was feeling kind of guilty because oh. he was rebuilding his relationship mm-hmm. with his dad. But everybody assured him it was not his fault. But he felt very guilty because of that. I, can, I mean, yeah, I get that. So he's in the hospital. And again, he's been clean for about a year. He's in the hospital, and they have to amputate his leg. And so they, they give him Oxycontin. Yep. And when he's home recovering from the amputation, he's taking the Oxys and he's drinking beer with it. And pretty soon he relapses yeah. into drug and alcohol abuse. Oh, that's terrible. And so often prescribed drugs are exactly how people get looped into that kind of behavior. Looped. Oh, huh. 
That's product placement. But in the midst of a sentence about a terrible thing. Yeah, it's just how we roll. So, so he, he's feeling guilty about this. Uh-huh. He's relapsed back into substance abuse, and he's thinking, I'd like to memorialize my dad. I'd like to do a tribute to my dad. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to ask the hospital to give me my leg back, and I am going to create a, a monument to my father with, with my leg bones. My, so, um, so what might that, what might that entail that, what? Okay. So he tells the hospital, I want my leg. No, that's fine. Yeah. And they said, okay, fine. So they gave the leg to the local mortician who put it in a garbage bag and took it to. They don't make. Ziplocs that big, do no, they? No, so like, that's fine. Yeah. So they they bring it uh, to his house, and there's a documentary on this. It's called Finders Keepers. Watch it. It is a wonderful film. They did a great job with it. But in it, um, John is interviewed, and he said that uh, he saw the mortuary van pull into the driveway, mm-hmm. and so he goes out to meet him, and he said, "They handed me my leg right there in the driveway." Okay. And so he takes it inside, and it's in a garbage bag, and he opens up the garbage bag, and he sees that it's not a, a like leg bone, which is what he... Was it's it, his leg. It's flesh, muscle, right? the whole thing. I mean, thing. they didn't put it in a vat of acid before they gave it to him. No, no. It was clearly not what he expected. He just wanted his leg bone and his foot bone to make a nice, loving memorial to his to his dad i still don't understand but that's fine so he decides okay well i'm an artsy craftsy kind of guy Uh um i'm going to debone my own leg okay and so he tries to do that Mm -hmm. and he starts to pull the skin off his leg and and he decides maybe he doesn't have the stomach oh he gets a little freaked out by it yeah yeah so it didn't work out well for him. So he decides that uh, he needs to preserve the leg for the time being until he can figure out, you know, what he's going to do with it. Well, I have a, I have a question. If yeah. he just wants the bone, why does he need to preserve it? Well, he, he didn't know how to get rid of all the flesh and everything. So in the meantime, he didn't, while he was trying to figure it out, he didn't want it to like rot in his house. Oh, okay. So he wraps it up. It's just a logistics thing. Got yeah. it. And he tries to, to store it in the freezer in his kitchen, mm-hmm. but there's not enough room. There's no. just not enough room. No, home freezers can be very small. So he came up with, uh, with a solution. He remembered that he had a friend who worked at the local Hardee's. Okay. And they had a very large freezer there. Now, this is a fast food chain, correct? Yeah, right. It's, it's, a, it's a burger place. Got it. So he goes down to the Hardee's, and he talks to his friend. And his friend agrees to put his sever, severed leg in the freezer at Hardee's. Did they alert their customers to the fact that their burgers were coming from the same freezer as a leg? No, no. No. Um, but as John said in the documentary, Finders Keepers, they put it in the freezer Right on top of the sausage biscuits. No. Uh, yep. No. Uh, so, so by the time he gets home, oh. the manager has shown up and goes to the freezer and finds John's severed leg lying yep. there on the on the uh, the sausage biscuits. The sausage biscuits, and he 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 calls John and says, "You can't, you can't. We know you have to come get your leg." Why did his friend think that was an okay choice? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe he felt bad because his friend had one leg. Maybe. So John gets back on his motorcycle, and he rides down to the Hardee's to pick up his leg, and he, they give it to him in the drive-thru. He oh. Just, he goes he to just the went, drive-thru. He was like, I left my leg here. Yep. My friend put sure. it in the freezer. Can they you just, just grab that they, leg? Yep. Right at the drive-thru. Okay. Uh, welcome to Hardee's. Can I take your order? Um, I'd like a burger and fries, please. Would you like to try one of our new Hardee's severed human leg breakfast croissants? <laughs> With that. Oh, thank you. <laughs> At this point, John's thinking, well, maybe my best opportunity 
is to mummify the leg. Mm. So he contacts the local mortician. You know, apparently he was on a pretty good basis with this guy because he was always at his house dropping off severed body parts. Did he not want to make a memorial out of his bones anymore? Well, at this point, I don't know if he's thinking clearly because he's relapsed into some pretty okay. serious... Oh, yeah. So he's thinking, I'm going to mummify my leg. So he gets a bunch of formaldehyde and he just soaks the leg in it. Okay. And in accordance with uh, traditional Egyptian mummification practices, he decides to, quote, put it up in the possum tree and let it sun dry. That didn't deliver the results that uh, he was hoping for. I, so, I'm sorry. What's possum tree? I don't know. It's, I'm just <laughs> quoting him. I'm just quoting him. Is that a kind of tree that it, I don't know about? It must be a tree that possums hang out in. Well, in that case, I think that you're asking for trouble. <laughs> if you're hanging body parts in a possum tree. Yeah. Well, anyway. The possums are great. You should encourage them being around your home. They're great. So this didn't deliver the results that he was looking for. No. So this is when he wrapped the leg up and he put it in his barbecue smoker and stuck the grill in his storage container. Now, John was going through a bad time. Yep. And he had a pretty tough life. Like I said, he and his dad had a rocky relationship. Right. His um, last day with his dad probably wasn't the best, Mm. you know, with the whole dying in a plane crash thing. Right. Um, But he also, a lot of bad things happened to this guy. Um, He he had been shot. No. He... uh, Separate from the leg incident. Yep. That's interesting. Also electrocuted. Oh. And then run over by a state dump truck. Did he invent the saxophone? <laughs> you have to go back to a previous episode to understand that callback <laughs> reference. No, that didn't happen all at once. Okay. Okay. But uh, that was before the plane crash. Sure. So you know. Is the being run over by the state dump truck how they got all their money? <laughs> Because it seems like a really good way to get a bunch of money. <laughs> Maybe. Maybe that helped. I'm not sure. So because he's, you know, back in the throes of substance abuse, right. the payments on the storage locker lapse. Yeah. And it goes up for sale. And that's where Shannon Winsnet comes got in. It. Got so, it. So, Shannon has come to buy your leg. There's no more lyrics no, to that. Yeah. It's nor, just... nor should there be. <laughs> So, back to Shannon. He was enjoying the notoriety that he was receiving. Sure. He kind of liked being called the footman. The footman. And uh, he sees this as a ticket to fame and fortune. Mm -hmm. He decides to create this roadside attraction. Right. Uh, But then the police show up, and they take the leg, and they didn't know what to do with it. Does he not have a permit for a roadside attraction leg? No, apparently not. So, they take it, and they take it back to the mortuary. Because they didn't know what else to do with it. The mortuary guy's like, can I get this leg off my balls? God. (laughs) Shannon quickly realizes that uh, people aren't going to come and see an empty barbecue grill. So he goes down to the the funeral home Mm -hmm. and puts up a big fuss and demands to get the leg back. And, of course, this gets news attention as well. That's when um, John, the original owner, saw on TV that this guy had his leg. He didn't know up until that point. So he decides to call a press conference in the parking lot of the local Dollar General store. Not the Hardee's. Not the Hardee's. That would be weird. That would be too weird. That would weird. be weird. Yeah. So Shannon hears about this. Uh-huh. You know, and because there are TV cameras. Of course there's a Dollar General nearby. <laughs> <laughs> oh, is it in the middle of nowhere where there's nothing else and then just randomly a Dollar General? There's a Dollar General. And a leg. Uh-huh. All right. So the TV crews are there, mm-hmm. and John's making his statement about how, you know, he wants his leg back. Give me that leg. And Shannon, of course. You can't have this leg. He wants to be on camera. Right. So he, as this live broadcast has taken place, he slowly inches his way into the camera shot until he's in it as well. And I guess the end result of it was that they agreed to talk off camera. 
<laughs> yeah, exactly <laughs> okay, like that. Okay, okay. So they come up to, with, a, with an agreement that... Uh, shared custody? Yes, exactly. No. Shared custody. Uh, Shannon would show the leg, and then they would split the profits. Now, John really wasn't into that, but he agreed to it thinking, I'll get my hands on my leg, and then I'll just you know, renege on the deal, and that'll be that. Um, but Shannon finds out that John is planning to steal his own leg back. Great. Right. Of course, this creates more news coverage. By this point, this story is getting covered all over the world. And the TV show Judge Mathis, okay. the producers hear about it, and they contact Shannon and John, and they say, it's like a Judge Judy show. Okay. Come on, and we'll, you know, we'll settle this in front of the live cameras. Mm-hmm. So that's what they do. They go on, and uh, the result was that John got his leg back, but he had to pay Shannon $5,000 for the storage container, the back payments of the storage container. Okay, okay. All right. Um, that makes sense, because it's the property that was within the storage mm-hmm. container that Shannon had paid for. Right, exactly. All right, all right. Um, now, John was really blasted on Peruvian marching powder during the filming of this. Oh, no. He was high as a kite. And Judge Mathis noticed that. Oh. And so after the taping, he had his um, producers contact uh, John and offered to pay for his um, rehabilitation. What? He paid to put him in a really high-end uh, rehab facility. Is that a thing that this man does? In this case, yes. And John accepted, and he went, and he got clean. He recovered, which was pretty cool. I'm sorry. Is that a thing that this man does? Like, he has people come on who are in rough ways, and then he's like, let me just help you fix your life? Because that's amazing. He did in this case, yes. Okay, I'm going to look into that. Meanwhile, Shannon continues to market himself as the footman. And he... <laughs> And he gets a shot on a reality show called The Dukes of Haggling. No. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Or The Dukes of Haggle or something like that. Wow. But he quits the show early on over uh, creative differences. Sure. Mm -hmm. Uh, Quick question. Does he have like a a shtick? Does he have like an outfit that he wears Mm -hmm. when he's selling his foot wares? He has merch. Oh. Yep. He actually has... Or he had T-shirts with a logo of a, of a severed leg on a barbecue grill, and it said, I'm friends with the footman. No. Hmm? And so he invested his money in this. So at this point, he's, he's on a, a local talk radio show, and he starts belittling John and John's father, making fun of uh, his piloting skills and just kind of some... Oh, that's you know, tacky. Some, some low blow kind yep. of things. But... He also was very candid and made kind of a revealing comment. He, he talked about how Tom Wood pretty much employed everybody mm-hmm. in the town except his family. Oh. And he said that anybody oh. who was anybody that had a birthday had it at John Wood's house. Any kid who was anybody had their birthday party at John Wood's house. But he he never had his birthday party at John Wood's house. He said, I guess I wasn't anybody. Oh, he had a feelings heart and decided to be a dink about it. Mm -hmm. Maybe he should seek the help of Judge Mathis. Judge Mathis, after that episode, uh, Winsnet continued to uh, promote himself as the footman for 10 years after the show, selling his merchandise, appearing on podcasts, and I attempted to sell a book of essays as well. About the foot? I don't know what the essays or were Or just about. about his entrepreneurial nature. Maybe that was it. That came out funny. Entrepren- entrepreneur- entrepreneurial nature. Please continue. Things continue to go downhill for Shannon. In 2014, he was arrested for driving around a Wells Fargo bank brandishing a 38 revolver. Oh, no. He was later released into the care of a local hospital for unspecified reasons. Wait, this is leg man? This is foot man, yeah. What's what's going on with... Is he just having some emotional issues? Yes. Because... He was having some kind of a breakdown. Oh, man. Yeah. Everyone in this story is sad. Yeah, and that's that's a point that I really want to make here. Uh, both players in this story, Shannon, 
Winsnet and John Wood appear to be products of difficult childhood Mm -hmm. relationships. Mm -hmm. Um, In John's case, his father was always pushing him to be the best that he could be and set really high standards. And John felt that he could not live up to that. Okay. And because uh, at first it was like, okay, no, that's just good parenting. But I see if it was too high, then okay, fine. When he fell into uh, drugs, his father wrote him off. Oh yeah. Um, he was a year clean trying to rebuild his relationship. Right. When his dad died uh, that fateful day when the plane went down. Shannon, once again, in the documentary finders keepers talks about uh, very candidly, his relationship with his father growing up, and he said, and he gets like kind of teary eyed at this point, and he says, My dad would beat me. No kid should be beaten to the point where he can't catch his breath. Oh, geez. So there's really no villain and no hero in this story. And really, it's two victims. It really is. John successfully recovers from his addictions. He returns to work. Okay. Um, he gets engaged. Okay. Um, a local veterinarian helps him debone his leg. Great. Meanwhile, Shannon concludes that the barbecue grill is cursed, and the only way to lift the curse is to throw it in the ocean. So he does that. And then he announces his candidacy for president of the United States in 2016. Oh, Shannon, what is going on? Oh, he was, why would why would throwing it in the ocean? Why? I don't know. Maybe he could have opened a barbecue. Like he loves a roadside stand, right? Yeah. Just come up with a really good sauce. Unfortunately, things didn't end well for Shannon. Oh, Shannon. Um he struggled with morbid obesity all of his life. I get it. And then uh, in November of 2016, he uh, had a fatal heart attack. Oh, Shannon. Since all of this transpired, uh, Wood performs charity work at uh, the Woodford Landfill in North Carolina. He's a recyclable uh, organizer. He told the Charlotte Observer that uh, he got into charity work because he felt that the film, the documentary film Finders Keepers, mm-hmm. might have convinced some viewers that he was pushing a bizarre Southern stereotype, and he wanted to prove that he was more than just some guy who got into a fight over an amputated leg. Um, so so he sorts recycling, but he volunteers to do that? I'm not sure exactly what that entails, but he believes that it's important it's important to him to I love that to involve himself in uh, charitable work and give back to his community. I have to say there is a thing where my mom lives um, where they have like the dump, you know. Um, but they also have like the dump guy has a room where he puts things that people think might be useful to other people. So there may be items that they don't want anymore that would be bound for the dump. Sure. But if they're not necessarily dump worthy they go into this room and if you are live in the town you can just come into that room and check it out and see if there's anything that you can use and i think that that is glorious and should be mandatory in every city and state well john's leg didn't end up in the uh landfill second chance room okay (laughs) um what happened to that was uh, that's right i why didn't i wonder that he uh i was like meh He stored it in the bottom of his golf bag for a while, uh, and then he moved it. Did he have, like, one of those golf socks on it, like the (laughs) the golf club socks? That would make sense, wouldn't it? In fact, that would be great. A little pom-pom on the Let somebody borrow borrow your your golf clubs, and you pull the sock off it, and it's just this gnarly foot. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I need the nine iron. Anyway. No, I said nine iron. He, uh... Not severed foot. (laughs) Um, he ends up encasing it in epoxy and, and, you, and building the memorial to his dad. Oh, he yeah. did build the memorial. Mm-hmm. With, a, with the entire leg, you know. Well, Not I guess just the no, bones. No, actually, it, it, the veterinarian got most of the... He did the yeah, deboning. There was some, but mo- yeah. Anyway, in 2015, John Wood won the lottery. Mm. <laughs> John Wood! Yep. He, uh, after all of this, he wins the fucking lottery. Um, and he tells the New York Times, it wasn't a lot of money, but it was enough to say, hey, nice one. I see what you're doing here. Like somebody above is really having fun with the story. And uh, as far as I know, that's where 
it's all been left okay. at this point. I'm not sure where he keeps his severed foot um, as a memorial to his dad, but it's is not like like a plaque or a no. It's just it's, it's a thing that he has for himself. It's like a yeah, like a like a really morbid bowling trophy. It just in. You know, maybe okay. it's on his mantle. See, when I think memorial, I think it's like a, something in a public place, like mm-hmm. a bench, but one of the bench legs is his femur. <laughs> so you're suggesting that he incorporate uh, his severed remains into furniture. That's actually functional. I'm telling you, I am about recycling. <laughs> maybe you could work with him at the recyclable plant. I'm into it. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, there you go. Uh, the story of... Footman. That was a real roller coaster. Yeah, it really was. Sorry about that. Thanks for listening to the Box of Oddities. Now it's time for intermission, so won't you please stretch your legs and have a smoke, buy some snacks and drinks. Or use the toilets and wash your hands in those bathroom sinks. However, if you're not attending the live show right now, this doesn't apply to you and you can pee wherever we don't care when or how. But nonetheless, the larger point I'm making is just this. It's intermission and we'll be back as soon as everyone takes a piss. Piss! Show starts in five minutes. What's up, freaks? Are you ready for the strange, the bizarre, the unexpected? Cat and Jethro Gilligan talk. Tell the oddest stories to your ears unprotected. Stories of pugs and the snorties. How weird. And the poop chart. Okay, that's actually pretty weird. Any whoozle. Thank you listeners for being with us here As we lift the lid and cautiously peer Inside the box of oddities It's sometimes dark and morbid But full of quality So let's lift the lid and cautiously peer Inside the box of oddities Why is cats laugh so infectious? And why do Cat and Jethro live next to Stephen King? And many more mysteries that are so super weird. Thank you listeners for sticking with us here. As we lift the lid and cautiously peer inside the box of oddities. It's sometimes dark and morbid but full of quality. of oddities brings you that thing in the middle are ah, the 1860s 
What an amazing time to be alive! Especially if you enjoy dysentery and large piles of horse manure. It was also a time of discovery and learning. Hey, look everyone, it was 1863 and the doors opened for the very first time at the Mutter Museum in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. As a surgeon, Dr. Thomas Dent Mutter, oh that name, had accumulated medical oddities for teaching purposes. Over the years, it grew into a sizable collection used in founding the museum. Inside the Mutter Museum's corridors rest the strangest and most grotesque displays of medical specimens and artifacts. Some might call it a modern-day freak show, but it's so much more. In this 19th century cabinet museum setting, the museum teaches one to understand the human body's mysteries and beauty, and appreciate the history of diagnosis and disease treatment. It's also pretty frickin' weird. Case in point, the soap lady. See, in 1875, a woman's body was exhumed from a small Philadelphia graveyard. She's unique because a fatty substance called adipocere encases the remains. Often referred to as grave wax, its formation is not common. It's known to form in alkaline, warm, airless environments such as, well, the one in which the soap lady was buried. The reason for the woman's exhumation has been lost to history, but the woman's legacy lives on. More specifically, in the gift shop, where, for that special someone, you can purchase a soap lady on a rope. We're not making this up. Looking for an exhibit that's a little more uplifting? Try the dried up hand display. Yes, the youngsters will love it, and it'll make you feel much better about your own dry skin. And if those hands are just too dried up for your taste, well, it's only a short walk to the pre-moistened gout hands exhibit. And boy, are these hands gouty. But if hands bloated by an excessive buildup of uric acid crystals and soaked in alcohol is not your thing, then why not swing by the giant colon pavilion? Just how giant is this colon? We just knew you'd ask. Well, when the man who once owned this colon died, it was 30 inches or 76 centimeters around at its widest point. And it had over 40 pounds or 18 kilos of fecal matter packed inside. My, that's a lot. But don't worry, it's currently stuffed with tissue paper and enclosed in a tasteful glass case. And what self-respecting medical oddities museum doesn't have its very own set of twins in a jar? Most displays like these look similar to each other, you know, being twins and all. What makes this one unique is these twins appear to have been frozen in place while performing a song and dance routine on the early vaudeville circuit. Now that was entertainment. Here at the Box of Oddities, we're all about repurposing. Well, for the most part. As much as we appreciate the creative energy that goes into any dermatological arts and crafts project, this genital wart necklace is so last season. Ever wonder what a head with a serious syphilis infection kept in a jar looks like? So did we! It turns out it wasn't everything we hoped for. But three syphilis infected heads in jars? Pinch me, I must be dreaming! As bizarre and unsettling as all of this may be for some people, the Mutter is not the museum that houses the most unexpected exhibits. That distinguished title may have to go to the Victor Wind Museum of Curiosities, Fine Art and Unnatural History in London. There, you can view such priceless artifacts as a bag of Russell Brand's pubic hair and, dreams come true, Kylie Minogue's poop in a mason jar. Sealed, of course. The Box of Oddities with Kat and Jethro Gilligan-Toth. Well, that was weird. Super weird. How about them gouty hands? They're gouty. They're so gouty. I just want to thank the curator for being so amazing and everything that is good about this show. Yeah, we love the curator. He's... He's a weird little person. Well, he's not little. He's pretty 
pretty average size. Well, he's a weird. Yeah, but that doesn't sound as cool when I. He's a weird, average sized person. Right, but little sounds snarky. Does it like you're, you're belittling him? Uh, yes. I certainly don't want to belittle the curator. You know, he'll shut be us talking down. Talking about your weird little friends. He'll shut us down. <laughs> <laughs> shut this whole thing down. So what you got for me? Oh, oh, okay. Yes, I have a thing that I wanted to tell you. Okay. All right. I'm very well, excited. several things. It's a it's a series of things. A plethora of things. All right, so sideshows uh, search for the most amazing and unbelievable exhibits to entertain and amaze, of course, you know. And the thing is, like, once you've seen one giant foot, you know, you've seen them all. Or a severed one. Or, or a severed mm-hmm. one, exactly. Mm-hmm. So you have to keep, like, upping your game. And, uh, of course, that involves uh, looking for talented individuals who can do amazing and interesting things. Um, that could mean traveling the world, looking for oddities that the average circus-going farmer might not have seen before. <laughs> circus-going farmer. <laughs> If this were a regular episode, that would be the title. Yep. Um, and uh, sometimes it can involve more creative measures. Ooh. Now, one example of this is something I enjoy thoroughly is the Really Real Frog Band. Now, the Really Real Frog Band was marketed as a sideshow attraction where you could see frogs playing instruments. <laughs> I, would, I would pay whatever it took right. to see that. <laughs> well, Was I there mean, one little frog with a banjo? Oh, please. Yeah, I'm Don't, sure. Oh, I'm sure. Maybe for, the little one played tambourine. That hmm. sounds more likely. Hello, my baby. <laughs> Someone's got to play the cowbell, though. Um, and yes, they were live frogs. Or, or once were live frogs. Oh. The thing is, of course, taking living animals on the road is difficult, especially, you know, very talented frogs mm-hmm. uh, demands their divas and all that business. Sure, the, the concert rider alone must be just unbearable. Right. I need red M&Ms and flies. <laughs> Lots of flies <laughs> in my dressing room. So... Ribbit. When... <laughs> So when you got to the attraction after you had paid your way in, you saw that these were, yes, real frogs, but they were stuffed. Okay. The thing is, they once played music, but now they're dead. So you can't expect them to, right? You can't expect dead frogs to be playing in a band. That's ridiculous. Did they animate them? No. They didn't need to. They used to play instruments. That's all... well, okay. the thing is, they're dead. You can't, they can't play instruments now. Was there documentation that they did at one point play instruments, or was that just hearsay? Yeah, well, I mean, there were illustrations you're, of you're those a, frogs playing a, instruments. You're a wannabe attorney. <laughs> I object. <laughs> now, these frogs, were, they all still had their instruments, their little frog size mm-hmm. instruments, um, they just, you know, they can't be expected to be playing them. They've passed on. <laughs> Don't be outlandish. There are limitations when you're a dead frog. Exactly. Another example of this is the snake-eating frog. Now, the banner out front showed this, uh, you know, s- giant frog with a little snake tail between his lips, you know, all like, meh, meh, you know, yeah. a sneaky little ribbit, I'm sure, yeah. kind of like, and then maybe one, like a little burp afterwards, like, because <laughs> he ate a big meal just now. <laughs> um, but when you, again, got into the exhibit, you found that there was a snake eating a frog. It's a snake eating frog. It's a snake eating frog. Uh, okay. All right. So it's wordplay. It's well, no, it just says it right there. Snake eating frog. This is what you paid to see. Okay. Snake eating frog. Now, does the snake constantly eat frogs? Because I would think that at some point he's going to be full. Well, maybe they had multiple snakes that they switched oh. around. I, I'm not sure about Th- the them, details of that. Them carnies is clever. <laughs> Um, so, as you can see, sometimes they just had to 
Make it work. Sure. Yeah. So in the 1960s and early 1970s, at shopping malls, state fairs, and carnivals across the United States and Canada, there was a sideshow exhibit that depicted a man-like creature frozen in a block of ice. And it was promoted as the missing link. Mm. Now, of course, people were very interested in this. Of course. We, I'd, we, I'd want to see that. We all have curiosities about where we came from and uh, if we evolved from, you know, interesting creatures. Uh, and it was said that this was the link between Neanderthals and us. So, absolutely fascinating, right? He hmm. was called the Minnesota Iceman. Oh, that sounds familiar. So he was a very hairy carcass, uh, a little over five feet tall. Uh, <laughs> my notes here say uh, preserved a nice, which means <laughs> that my uh, dictation machine misunderstood when I said preserved on ice, but it says preserved a nice. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. A nice. <laughs> a nice. Preserved. <laughs> Okay. Uh, he was billed as uh, Siber Skoy. So Frank Hansen was the man who was putting Siber Skoy on display, and he toured around the country with it. And so it was a frozen, floating 6,000 block of ice originally, he said. Um, and they were able to chisel him out of mm. this giant block of ice off the coast of Siberia, hence the Siber Skoy. Um, and that was originally discovered by a Russian fishing vessel. Of course. Yes. Um, later, it was a Japanese fishing vessel. Um, and later than that, it was that he was just found in a deep freeze in Hong Kong. Okay. In Hong Kong? Yeah, well, you know. Mm. Mm. So he claimed <laughs> that a wealthy Californian uh, purchased the Iceman and wished for the creature to be toured around the country. But due to this Californian's very high social status and notoriety, uh, he didn't want to do that himself. Okay. So it wasn't something he could do, but so he hired Frank Hansen to do mm. it. Many... Uh, suspected it was Jimmy Stewart. So, <laughs> Jimmy Stewart. Jimmy Stewart so Jimmy bought Stewart a frozen missing link. Frozen missing link in in an ice thing. Yep. And then hired Frank Hansen uh -huh. too. And no one knows exactly how the name Jimmy Stewart got thrown around, but some suspect it was Frank Hansen. Let me, let me, let now, me, let, let me introduce you to my friend. My friend. Harvey, the frozen, frozen guy. I do the worst Jimmy Stewart no, impersonation. No, it's really good. It's ever. really you're the best yeah. at it. Mm -hmm. you're the, it's so good. It's so good. Mm. Mm. So his story was that this guy, Jimmy Stewart, uh, or or whoever, whoever Californian guy, um, had asked Hanson to show the creature around the country, um, but then it. Fran Fran Franson, <laughs> Franson, as I will call him from now from on. From now on, that's his name. Not Frank Hansen, but Franson. Mm -hmm. It's like Benifer. Then Franson decided that uh, instead what had happened was he, he might have shot the creature himself while he was on a hunting trip in Minnesota. And he just forgot until... Recently, well, that it's, you don't had know some sort of a happened. blackout. Seems kind of or... weird that he was then frozen in a block of ice. Mm -hmm. But uh, what else? So every summer he'd go around with this missing link um, from attraction to attraction, and people would pay their dollars to see this uh, Minnesota Iceman. And he was always in a block of ice. Always in a block of ice. That's a great scam. What? 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 <laughs> <laughs> it's not a scam. I'm a so um, two cryptozoologists uh, named Sanderson and Huevelmans 
uh, examined the Iceman in December 1968 at Hansen's home where he'd been storing it off season. So Still in the ice? Yes. Okay. Yeah, it's always in the ice. Mm-hmm. So they're not on the road right now, and so it's a good time to go and take a take a sneaky peeky. And so uh, Sanderson and Ravelmans uh, went to his home, and they popped in on the Minnesota Iceman. And while they were there, a crack appeared in the ice. Oh. And from that crack emitted this terrible decomposition smell. And oh. they were like, oh, my gosh. It's real. This guy is for real. They were hooked. Huevelman's was hooked. Mm. It's the most fun name to say. <laughs> it is the most fun. Okay, so they were hooked. And Huevelmans uh, published a paper in the Belgian Scientific Journal about this new human genus that he named Homo pongodes, meaning ape-like man. And uh, he later modified that proposal, saying that this was a form of living Neanderthal and that they were still out in a boot. Out in a boot? Yeah. I mean, I told you he toured in Canada oh, as well. Oh, that's right. I forgot that you had said that. Uh, and this is all based on a smell. Well, I mean, also they, they got to see him. He was he looked hairy and neat. And, but, yeah, I mean, it was a big – it was a key factor was that okay. that happened to happen while they were there. They, yeah. There happened to be a crack in the ice at that time. So then Sanderson, <laughs> um, who was doing some TV appearances, and he was talking about this this missing link and how it was a big deal. I mean, it was a big find, you know? Mm-hmm. It, it yeah. was a big deal. Yeah. Well, yeah. So he reached out to John Napier, who worked for the Smithsonian. And he was asking John Napier to investigate on behalf of the Smithsonian. Okay. And so John Napier was like, yeah, yeah, all right. I mean, if this is a legit creature that is part of our ancestry, you know, we absolutely want to investigate and we want to get on, you know, some papers and stuff and get them in our museum and all that business, right? I love the Smithsonian. I miss the Smithsonian. I Actually, cannot wait to go back. I miss pretty much everything outside. Yeah. 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 I miss outdoors. It's a good time. Mm. It's a good time. So anyway. it was right around this time that um, that John Napier said, yeah, absolutely, I'll go and investigate, right? That Franson was like, uh, you know what, we're off the road for a while, so uh, you can't, can't, sorry, it, we got, we're not available mm-hmm, for mm-hmm, mm-hmm. inspections at said time, uh, off the tour circuit, sorry, sorry. Uh, it's not my fault, though, that it's the wealthy Californian. Jimmy Stewart wants him off the road. Oh, I see. Okay. You didn't say Jimmy Stewart. No. But everyone expected or suspected that it was Jimmy Stewart. There were some suspicions. Okay. That it was Jimmy Stewart. But uh, it's a real bummer. Sorry, guys. Mm. Sorry. Anyway, so uh, wicked sus. Anyway, Napier, in conjunction with the Smithsonian, made some investigations into the claims. They didn't necessarily need to see the Minnesota Iceman in order to investigate the sitch as it was. And during this investigation, they did discover that um, Hansen had commissioned uh, the creation of a very Iceman-like figure from a company on the West Coast in 1967. Uh Aha. Well, well, you'd think, uh aha, you'd you'd think so. I I just did, Mm. in fact. But... he had that made only so that he wouldn't damage the real sure. one. It's for insurance purposes. Right. Yeah. Um, it was like it, when he went to places where he wasn't sure if the Iceman was going to be taken care of mm-hmm. the way he mm-hmm. needed to be. Mm-hmm. Um, he had that one as a backup. Oh, I see. Okay. So that one, mm-hmm. you know, if, listen, if he was responsible for this one example mm-hmm. of the missing link. Sure. You know, and if this thing was living and had the the possibility of potentially being reanimated at oh. some point he wouldn't be re- he wouldn't want to be responsible for killing a human being he was just 
being empathetic is he what was you're being saying. a responsible sure. human yeah. I, I mean he was charged with an incredible find <laughs> and couldn't couldn't be expected to put that at no. risk anyway no. so he was just being a responsible huckster the, oh, yeah so uh today the minnesota iceman is owned uh, by steve busty of the Museum of the Weird in Austin, Texas. Mm. And there are those that still believe that the Minnesota Iceman is our missing link. Uh, and there are those that uh, still think that he's living in Jimmy Stewart's house, I guess. Sure. You know, it would be a pretty easy thing to uh, test the ice and see how old the ice is. Without damaging the specimen itself. See, when you said test the ice, I thought you were being like metaphoric. You know, test the ice. No, no. But you were just saying you should test the ice. Literally test the ice. Because they can tell how old that is. You, or you, just thaw the fucker out. Maybe that's, maybe it had thawed and then refroze. You don't know. That's true. I don't. There Branson are so many- would have a reason why that wasn't a great choice okay well i'm not going to question franson Mm. here's a man who clearly knows what he's doing obviously great story thank you so we need to go and see the minnesota Iceman a thousand percent put it on the list i have to yeah now circassian beauties are you familiar with circassian beauties putting it on the list oh that's not a pen no, I don't know what that is. All right, so of course we'd end up talking about P.T. Barnum, right? Of course. All right. So Kersa- Ker- <laughs> Circassian, Circassian women were considered by many writers and travelers to be simply the most beautiful women in the world. Um, they're well known, uh, not by me and apparently not by you, no, but by I've many. No, I've never heard of them. Um, as being just historically the most beautiful women and they were traded as slaves since the medieval period and many ended up in harems in the ottoman empire and persian rulers now pt barnum had a harem of these circassian beauties uh, that were the same fabled women from the Russian mountains whose sex appeal had been legendary. (laughs) And uh, naturally, they had been sex slaves and concubines, which is just so exotic and fun, right? Sure, there's nothing more fun than sex slaves. (sighs) P.T. Barnum, I I really struggle with this guy. I know. Anyway. He was a product of his time. Mm. So... (laughs) So um, he had these beauties who uh, washed their hair in beer and then would tease it out. So they had this weird round hair halo uh, that was like mossy in texture. And, uh, and people could come and see these beautiful Circassian beauties, right? They would pay money to see these women who were in fact just poor American women who were trying to get into show business. Who soaked their noggin in beer. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, which was weird because um, Circassian beauties were, were known and renowned for their long, tamed hair. So why P.T. Was... Barnum had this weird fro situation going on? It was just his way of, it was a big P.T. Barnum F.U. It was a... It was something. So, yeah. Now, we've talked before about Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Oh, yes. And his relationship with Houdini. Mm -hmm. Now, they had a short-lived friendship that was very weird um, because they came from two totally different mindsets. Sir Arthur Conan Doyle had this incredible openness to spirituality and uh, the things unknown. He wrote a whole book about how fairies were real. You're reading that now, right? I am reading that right now. Yes. Um, And then Houdini was like, everything's bullshit. (laughs) Watch me get out of this. Yep. That was his motto, in fact. Everything's bullshit. Watch me get out of this. (laughs) So um, (laughs) when Houdini heard that Sir Arthur Conan Doyle was coming to the States, he invited him to a meeting of the Society of American Musicians. Now... Musicians? 
magicians. Ah, that makes a lot more sense. Well, everyone likes music. Sure. So it was a marketing ploy on his part. Anyway, magicians. <laughs> we'll just edit that. Anyway, so upon receiving this invitation, um, Doyle was like, Real suspicious. He thought that he was being brought there to be embarrassed. He thought that Houdini was trying to be like, ha, you know, he was going to bring something up and be like, nah. Because even though they were friends, again, they had some real different ideas about what was and what was not. So he gladly accepted this invitation, was like, absolutely, I'm coming to your event. It's going to be amazing. I'll speak, in fact. So, yeah, so he got there and he was like, I am the guest of honor and I'm going to bring something amazing for you guys. And so he astonished the crowd with film of dinosaurs. And he convinced this room full of magicians and potentially musicians, you don't (laughs) know about their varied interests, that dinosaurs were real and tootling about. And here's some film to prove it. Right? This is Roll uh, that beautiful bean footage. Wow. Yeah. So um, it would be wise, he said, since you've seen this and since you understand that you don't know everything, you smarmy little bastards, <laughs> it would be wise to keep your minds open is all I'm saying. Right? That's all I'm saying. So um, later... Doyle addressed this whole incident uh, while speaking with the New York Times. And he said, oh, yeah, no, that was uh, part of a stop animation film uh, that I found uh, called The Lost World. And so I, um, I just showed it to them and said it was real. Didn't Doyle write The Lost World? He just thought maybe they should be taught a little lesson. Maybe they drive in the wrong lane too often, and he's got to speed up so they can't get in. Maybe they've got to be taught a lesson, is all I'm saying. She does that all the time. She will not let somebody cut in front of her without uh, speeding up to, as she says, teach them a lesson. Here's the thing, though, is if you're in the right lane, then it doesn't matter. But if you die in a fiery car crash, <laughs> it does. So anyway, that's the, the uh, Arthur Conan Doyle Houdini thing was not a sideshow hoax, but it was a fun Doyle hoax that I just adore him and everything that he ever did. So I, I just thought I would include that little tidbit there at the end. I think that we all enjoy a good Doyle hoax from time to time. You guys... We are looking forward to getting back out on the road really soon and doing um, a series of live shows Mm. in person. We miss you guys so much. But thanks for hanging out with us here uh, this evening on Looped. And uh, we'll we'll be doing other shows on Looped coming up. Absolutely. We're thinking maybe first week of June, something like that. Ish. Yeah. Yeah, We've got some ideas. We can't really share them yet because, well. We don't know them. We don't really have any ideas yeah. at this point They're but really um organized. we're we're looking forward to getting some and then sharing them with you <laughs> <laughs> i have to say that um being off the road for over a year now has been really hard and we've uh, we so enjoyed getting out and meeting you all but I have to say that the mail has been like my saving grace this oh, last year. It's like our connection with the, with the outside world. You people are amazing. And the things that you send us are outrageous and so appreciated. And they make everything a little bit better. We have quickly discovered that members of the Freak family are very creative, artsy, craftsy, artistic types. Talented beyond anything I could expect. And uh, at some point we'll make a video and show you. We have a whole room dedicated to uh, these beautiful things that people have made for us. And also given to us at other live shows. Yeah. Like uh, we we have... (laughs) We actually are, have received wet specimens at mm-hmm. live shows in D.C. Somebody gave us a, uh, was it a raccoon heart? I don't, I think it's a possum heart. Possum heart. It wasn't in the possum tree. No. But Different a, tree. A possum heart with a snake through it in a jar. 
That was tough to explain at TSA. But also someone like crocheted us a blanket, which I regularly nap with. And yeah. it's just sometimes I'll cuddle up with that. I'm like, I, someone made this for us. Yeah. And it just like and then the waterworks come right. and I can't. She, she weeps openly. We appreciate you guys so much. And we look forward to hanging out with you again soon, whether it's uh, – on looped or whether it's at a live show or whether you uh, listen to us on uh, the regular podcast, the box of oddities, which is available on all major podcast platforms and several minor ones. (laughs) Thank you guys so much. We look forward to seeing you next time. And until then keep flying that freak flag, fly it proudly. You beautiful freak. (laughs) 